Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the University of Bristol and this fourth Coleridge Lecture in partnership with Bristol 2015, the University of Bristol, the Bristol Festival of Ideas, and the Bristol Capital Institute. Uh, my name is Michael Basker. I'm the Dean of the Arts Faculty here at Bristol. Um, my own background is in Russian Romanticism rather than English Romanticism, though I did once edit the best Russian translation ever of the ancient mariner, so I've got a kind of sneaking reason for being here. Um, not much more than that. It does, however, mean that it's a great privilege to introduce this evening's proceedings. Um, and I'd like to begin simply by thanking not just Bristol 2015 and Cabot, but also Arts Council England, Bristol City Council, University of the West of England and Business West for the additional support they've given to this lecture series. And for myself, I'd just like to thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful sight, a, a packed hall yet again for one of these Coleridge Lectures. Today's lecture is part of the newly instituted Coleridge Lecture series. There are some other lectures coming up. Um, and my instruction on that is check the website or the brochures to see what follows over the next few weeks. For 2015, the theme is Radical Green. We have utopias, revolution, peace already mapped out for the coming years. Since the lecture series was inspired by Coleridge's radical lectures in Bristol in 1795, it's fitting that today's event is also part of a series of activities on, I think, the exceptionally rich topic of romantics and Bristol. Um, amongst other things, this includes a chance to go on a self-guided walk about the romantics in Bristol and the booklets. Here we have one available as you leave the room um, with lots of information to guide you around the city. Today's lecturer, Richard Holmes, is a fellow of the British Academy, an honorary fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge, and was made an OBE in 1992. His Coleridge Early Visions won the 1989 Whitbread Book of the Year, and the second book on Coleridge, Coleridge Darker Reflections, won the 1999 Duff Cooper Prize and the Heinemann Award. Richard Holmes was Professor of Biographical Studies at the University of East Anglia from 2001 to 2007. His other books include, but not entirely, Shelley the Pursuit, Dr. Johnston and Mr. Savage, and two studies of romantic biography and autobiography, Footsteps and Sidetracks. His group biography of romantic poets and scientists, another quintessentially Bristol topic, it seems to me, splendidly entitled The Age of Wonder, how the Romantic Generation Discovered the Beauty and Terror of Science, won both the Royal Society Book Prize of 2009 in the UK and the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction 2010 in the USA. The accolades keep coming, as you see. His latest book is a highly unconventional history of romantic ballooning, falling upwards, how we took the air. But today, as you can see, we're back on the Ancient Mariner. Rich is going to speak on that for 45, 50 minutes and that'll be followed by questions. So, Richard Holmes, thank you for coming to speak to us. Well, well, it, it's an honour to be at the European Green Capital, <laughs> and Coleridge would have liked that, I can assure you. Um, I may get onto balloons later, but first, it is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three by thy long grey beard and glittering eye. Now, wherefore stops thou me? Stops thou me? And this is a question I want to ask in that short period we have tonight. Why should courage stop you? Why is there something in the ancient mariner that speaks to us now. Is it possible that a poem, a strange poem, all 160, 70 lines of it, 670 lines, can that speak to us across 200 years? And if so, what is it saying? That's what I want to talk about this evening. First news, we have Coleridge here in the city, not yet green. Slave trade city, mm, I'm aware of that, is this little quotation from one of the local papers. 
we wish the damn Jacobin jawing away in the corn market could at least appear with darn stockings, clean linen, and better combed hair. <laughs> I think his linen looks pretty good to me, picture by Van Dyke there, uh, and a picture incidentally commissioned by one of the, our great local heroes, Joseph Cottle, the publisher, a great figure uh, who I know uh, ha people have been talking about here, and he's a very important part of the story. So Coleridge there, 22 years old, a political journalist, as he thinks of himself, ex Cambridge, and giving a series of moral and political lectures to uh, packed audiences in the corn market, but various places in Bristol, and not necessarily friendly audiences. So the tradition of debate, and often quite angry debate, is already here in Bristol. Now, I want to pick out from those lectures one particular image that has, I think, been much overlooked. Remember, the general subject was indeed the slaves, trades, taxation, the war, uh, even things like the hair tax, the hair powder tax. But the general angle that Coleridge and Southey were mounting there, an angle of attack, was something that I'm sure we're not familiar with, which is that our professional politicians were not to be trusted. <laughs> the public is confused and disaffected. Um, and there's a general sense that England, Great Britain, is drifting under political control. Drifting. And here's the image that comes from the first, the January 1795 lecture. Coleridge. When the wind is fair and the planks of the vessel are sound, we may safely trust everything to the management of professional mariners. But in a tempest and on board a crazy vessel, all must contribute their quota of exertion. Wonderful phrase, their quota of exertion. Even so, in the present agitation of the public mind, everyone ought to consider his or her intellectual and imaginative faculties as in a state of requisition. We must all be ready on deck. I think that call has a certain echo to us now. All right. Within three years of that, 95, that lecture, 98, we have the appearance of the rhyme of the ancient mariner. So as it were, that image of we all need to be on deck, the crazy bark is in a storm, that mounts from a political lecture into a whole poem, and I want to look at how that happened. As you remember, this is the first poem that appears in the Lyrical Ballads, the great collection, a slim volume actually, with uh, William Wordsworth, and it's the first poem in the book. And so say it's seven parts, 670 lines, uh, it occupies a, a, a key position, the sort of gateway position in the collection. And it's long. If you, if you read it out, you recited, it takes about 35 minutes to do. It's a big poem, although it appears very slim, and we'll talk about that. Now, what's its subject? Is that its subject? That's what everybody, if anybody asks. You ask, what's the poem? I vaguely remember it from school time. Oh, it's about the mariner shooting an albatross. Okay. That's a Mervyn Peak illustration, incidentally. Well, stand back a minute. What is the poem about? It's a sea disaster story. It's a sea disaster story in the same way that later Moby Dick will be a sea disaster story, in the same way that the film Jaws will be a sea disaster story. Something happens terrible to a crew out there. It's not quite clear what does happen, but the main action is the 200 members of the crew of this boat all die, except for one. And there's one survivor. 200 men die, and one man comes back. That's the central drama of the story. So you could say that perhaps, in some ways, it's a survivor's story. You could say, in a modern way, that perhaps it's 
the account of uh, traumatic stress syndrome. It's the one survivor who comes back having been through the most terrible experiences, which may be hallucinations. How real are they? But he has to repeat, repeat. We know this is one of the, um, one of the elements of those traumatic syndromes, people coming back from warfare and so on, the necessity of repeating the story, and that's one of the key things that the mariner has to do. He has to tell the story again and again, in fact, until he gets old, because he's young when he goes out. So that's one way of looking at it. So it's a traumatic survivor's story. It may also be a religious story in some way. It might be about the nature of evil. How does an evil act get done? What's the significance? What makes it evil? Is it, in some kind of case, a Christian allegory? Is the albatross a Christ figure? Is that possible? So that would be another way of looking at it. Third way, um, which somebody said to me rather tenderly, a musician, he said, well, it's like a country and western song. And it is, in a way, that the poem has a feeling. It uses folksy language. It's amazingly musical. It's rather easy to learn. And it strums along. It's got that feeling of a country, a music song. It's another way of looking at it. Uh, one more might be, for a biographer, this is the story of an opium addict who is almost destroyed by the hallucinations that this produces and comes back and has to redeem himself. That might be a biographical reading. So I just float those out, mainly to alert you to the fact that it is a mysterious poem and there are several ways of reading it. And I want to push it uh, in one particular direction which uh, will become clear. Here's Coleridge's own argument which he put uh, in a piece of prose at the beginning of the 1798 edition. How a ship, having first sailed to the equator, was driven by storms to the coal country towards the South Pole, and how the ancient mariner cruelly and in contempt of the laws of hospitality, in contempt of the laws of hospitality, killed a seabird, and how he was followed by many and strange judgments, and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country many and strange judgments. So that was put in front of the second edition of the Lyrical Ballads. If you put in Ancient Mariner to Wikipedia, if you were a student, you might very well do that. <laughs> what are the subject heads? I found them very interesting. Here you are. Voyages, religion, crime and punishment. We've already know there's now a Russian translation. Very good. Life and death. <laughs> Superstitions, seas, rivers, rains and streams, horror, faith and doubt, Christianity, weather, mythology, folklore, animals, drought, destruction, curses, guilt, birds, cruelty, nature, hospitality. Very interesting, almost a poem in itself. I have my moments of admiring Wikipedia. <laughs> Um, what I want to do very quickly is remind you, everybody will know the ancient man, but may not know the poem very well. They know the story, the myth. So I want to, with the, care, the help of uh, Gustave Doré, I want to just very quickly take you through, remind you uh, of some of the incidents, just some of the incidents. And the thing to say about Doré, this is... Um, <coughs> A wonderful um, illustration. He did a whole entire set towards the end of his life. French illustrator, worked in Paris, but he came at the end of his life to London, set up his own gallery, and he illustrated Paradise Lost and The Ancient Mariner. And there's a great tradition of illustrations of The Ancient Mariner, and I'm going to pursue that a little bit for very particular reasons, because it is so imagist. Um, and, of course, the illustrations, the style of them, are forms of interpretation, and I want to make you aware of that. So let's just go through the story. The boat sets sail, we think probably from Watch It, and it's driven south by the storm winds across the equator and into the Antarctic and southward 
I, we fled. And they get into ice. Wonderful. Uh, Dore, very characteristic with that rainbow. Is that a blessing rainbow, the albatross already there? Or is it quite sinister in some ways? And the ice, are those creature shapes, or is it just ice? And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice, mast high, came floating by, as green as emerald. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. At length did cross an albatross, Thorough the fog it came, as it had been a Christian soul. We hailed it in God's name. So there's the moment. The albatross comes above the boat, and the crew assume that it's some omen, perhaps of good luck. And then, right at the end of part one, the very end of the first part, the mariner, the young mariner, shoots the albatross with his crossbow. And there is no explanation in the poem of why he does it. None at all. It's the last line, I shot the albatross of part one. So we're left with this action. We're not sure what its significance is, with no explanation, no motive. Then the boat moves, sails back up, uh, and then is becalmed, and then the beginnings of terrible drought affect the crew, and they assume that the reason for this is that the albatross is in some way being revenged, and they hang the albatross about the neck of the mariner. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. And then, this is where the poem gets rather more complicated. Um, they see another ship. They think they're going to be saved. And in fact, it's this extraordinary invention of Coleridge's, the spectre ship. Brilliantly described, as it arrives at sunset, it crosses the setting sun, the sun shines through it, and it's clear that it's a skeleton ship. So it's like a mirror image of their own boat, but to which something terrible has happened. And when it comes alongside, it's only got two members of the crew, and one is the figure of death, and one is a female figure, life in death. Now, who these are, we'll come back to. But the idea that the, the first ship has met its mirror image, its demonic mirror image, where everything has gone wrong. So if the ship when it was crude and working, might be an image of a society working well. Indeed, it might be a whole planet working well. And suddenly, its opposite has arrived, where death and sickness and illness crew the ship. Then, because of certain actions on that spectre ship, we'll come to it, a game of dicing, the crew die. And there's this terrible image. The mariner is left alone, but the dead crew are all staring at him. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie. A thousand, thousand slimy things lived on. And so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. So that very powerful image, and again, it's the crew, the, now the dead crew are so important in the story at this point. And then the, the other stage that people do remember, this is how the albatross falls off his neck, because the, in an extraordinary sequence, the mariner 
almost hallucinating, looks out across the water at night and sees the, uh, what he calls the, the snakes and the fishes, and they're very beautiful. And this has a miraculous effect on him. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flesh, a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them, unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them, unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Now, people often assume that that, in a way, is the end of the mariner's experiences. It's not. Something even more strange happens. A polar spirit, described as a polar spirit, arrives underneath the ship and begins to drive it at terrifying speed. Uh, the crew are all dead, and he's being driven back north again by this polar spirit, and we'll come back to that. And then above the ship, you see the figures there related to the polar, polar spirit are airborne spirits. And they are talking about the mariner and saying he will do more penance. He has to suffer more before he comes home. So there's that whole set of further hallucinations. And then, to wrap this fairly swiftly, he comes back to the home port, watch it. The dead crew rise up and sail the ship in. It's an extraordinary moment. And then the harbour master and the hermit row out to collect him. And at that moment, the ship is struck by the spirit below and sinks with the dead crew. And the mariner row alone gets in to the rowboat. And the phrase is the pilot boy shouts, the devil knows how to row, because the survivor mariner looks completely not only mad, but devilish because of the experience he's gone through. And then, as you remember, he then has to begin to repeat his story. O oh, wedding guest, this soul has been alone on a wide, wide sea, so lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. Farewell. Farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. And that is, as it were, the takeout at the end of the poem. Now, um, I want to look just for a moment, before we go back and look again at the polar spirit and the spectre ship, a little bit of detail um, of how this poem actually got written. There's Coleridge three years later. Um, remember, he was at Cambridge. He was signed on to the Dragoons. Famous, it still exists in the Dragoons Regiment, the uh, discharged uh, document. Uh, Coleridge, um, known under STC, Cumberback, discharged, insane. That's how he's delivered, partly through his brother. He comes to Bristol. He meets uh, Wordsworth and Southey. Um, and there's Wordsworth a year later. And, of course, Dorothy. And they form that famous group and then settle, as it were, down the road in the Quantock Hills um, at the cottage. The cottage, incidentally, I sh should say, is now, um, it's now a world museum. And the Times uh, ran a competition uh, for what were the great museums of the world. And amazingly, Courage's Cottage at Nellestoy came in at number 39, I think. And I want to read you, because it's locally important. This is the, what the Times published about it, their little note. 
Lovingly restored by local subscription and the National Trust, this tiny but intensely atmospheric writer's museum has become one of England's hidden gems of literary remembrance. Here, Coleridge wrote many of the masterpieces of early romantic poetry, including The Ancient Mariner. You can inspect manuscripts and letters from that magic time. Learn about his walks with Wordsworth and Dorothy in the surrounding Quantock Hills. See the very far side where he sat with his baby Hartley and drafted Frost at Midnight. Or examine the dragoon sword which he abandoned for the poet's quill and even try out the quill. Don't miss the enchanting garden at the back just reopened where you can retreat to Coleridge's own arbor and listen to a recording of the poem he wrote, In its shade, this lime tree bower my prison. It's inspirational, even in the rain. <laughs> so that's what time, the Times published. And, uh, and it got it to 39 in the World Museum. And I'm particularly proud of it because I wrote that entry. And that's what got it in. <laughs> okay. So uh, just quickly placing that up here, as we know that the three of them um, on, roved on Quantock's airy ridge. Um, Wordsworth wrote this wonderful passage in the prelude, looking back. That summer, under whose indulgent skies upon smooth Quantock's airy ridge we roamed, we roved unchecked, or loitered midst her sylvan combs, thou in bewitching words, with happy heart, did chant the vision of that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. Uh, and of course, Lit Courage himself, looking back at that period in the Biographia, uh, describes how they agreed, him and Wordsworth, to write different kinds of poems. And of course, it would be the mariner for Courage. It was agreed that my endeavors should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic, and yet so as to transfer from our inward nature, a human interest, and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of the imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. That wonderful phrase, willing suspension of disbelief, you will see it again and again quoted so often. Uh, it's a favorite of journalists, and it's Coleridge who wrote it. The idea that you might suspend disbelief in something in order imaginatively to occupy it, to think about it. Key idea that you don't have to be, your skepticism doesn't immediately have to be put to work. Be free of that for a moment. Allow yourself to suspend disbelief. Very, very important and imaginative idea. We know that um, working uh, in, in this area that um, Courage had looked at a number of uh, previous ballads from uh, Bishop Percy's great relics of English poetry which, and Burgess, uh, the German ballads and so on. Um, and the idea was that maybe they'd write him and Wordsworth uh, ballads for the monthly magazine because they were planning a trip to Germany um, and maybe the ballads would defray the expenses. Um, and then um, they found together this passage uh, from Captain Shelbuck's voyage round the world. Uh, let me quote that. We saw, this is uh, quite, a, the book was published in 1776, 17, sorry, 1726, <coughs> but it's, a, it's relatively recent in those terms. And they were reading it together. We saw not one seabird except a disconsolate black albatross who accompanied us for several days, hovering above us as if he had lost himself till Hatley, my second ca captain, observing in one of his melancholy fits that this bird was always hovering near us, imagined from his color that it might be some ill omen. He, after some fruitless attempts, at length shot the albatross, not doubting, perhaps, that we should have a fair wind after it. I must own, that this navigation is truly melancholy and was more so to us who were by ourselves without a companion ship which would have somewhat 
diverted our thoughts from the reflection of being in such a remote part of the world and, as it were, separated from the rest of mankind. And the idea, the remote part of the world, separated from the rest of mankind and yet representing mankind and this amazing idea that there was no other ship. If there'd been another ship, they might have been safer. And of course, Coleridge introduces another ship, a spectre ship. So from that text, various ideas um, are released in his mind. And the idea of what causes, what is an evil act about, there in Shelvock, there is some explanation, the idea that um, the albatross was an ill-omened bird, and by shooting it in his melancholy state, this would make the ship safer. But this is not an idea that Courage himself introduces. One other source I want to look at there. There are many others, but this goes right back to his childhood. Um, those of you who know Ottery St. Mary, uh, in the church there is Bishop Grandison's sun and moon clock. Uh, it's still there with the sun and the moon going around. And we know that Courage, as a very small child, uh, listening to his father's sermons, used to sit under this clock and look up at it and watch the images of the sun and the moon moving. And gradually those images, of course, become very, very powerful in the whole of the mariner. The moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main like April hoarfrost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way, a still and awful red. So that the moon can be a, the spirit of peace and tranquility, but it can suddenly change and produce this burning red, this hellish symbolism. So these astronomical symbols, which I believe uh, really began there in his childhood, um, are developed in, throughout the poem. One further one I want to take you on. There, there's so many sources uh, that a biographer can find. For example, when I mentioned the dragoons, um, because he was so incompetent as, as a soldier, uh, when a fellow dragoon um, was, uh, went down with smallpox, Courage was assigned to look after the dragoon. And so they were shut up together in, Penley, in Henley Pest House, famous incident. And they spent seven days and seven nights there. And Courage acted as his nurse. And the dragoon was hallucinating all the time. So imagine for the young poet, he spent these seven days and seven nights with his fellow dragoon who was shouting, screaming, seeing hallucinations. And I think that goes very strongly into the poem. Incidentally, Courage saved that dragoon. That's his great deed as a soldier, was to save a fellow human being. That seems to me to go um, deeply into the poem. Um, one other thing I'll mention, there, there are many, but uh, the question of mice. Mice at the Stoey Cottage. Um, he'd settled there with his wife, Sarah. Uh, it was very basic. They didn't even have an oven. He had to run across the street to the bakers to bake anything, bread and so on. Um, and one of the problems in 1796, in the winter, was that the, um, the cottage filled with mice. And Sarah, his wife, was very keen that he should set traps for the mice. And Courage refused to do this. It must have been very annoying for Sarah, you think. <laughs> but this is what he wrote about it. Um, in fact, to Joseph Cottle. The mice play the very devil with us. It irks me to set a trap by all the whiskers of all the kittens that have ever mewed plaintively or amorously since the day of Dick Whittington. It is not fair. It is not just. It is telling a lie. It's as if you said, here is a bit of toasted cheese. Come, little mice, I invite you. When, oh, foul breach of the laws of hospitality, <laughs> I mean to assassinate my two credulous guests. All right. 
Now, there are many, biographers find many examples of that. The thing particularly there, it, it, it's ludicrous. Coleridge is very aware of this. But in a joke, a Coleridgean joke, can be the beginnings of something like the Mariner. It's very, very characteristic of the way his imagination works. It moves between the wild and humorous and it, quite surreal, suddenly breaking out into poetry. So um, there, there are several other sources, but let me just, this is the great Longstone Beach Alley where I go, walk every year up there, um, going up over the Quantock Hills where they left one November evening um, to walk to um, watch it down over the hills and to the modern harbour. Um, and uh, that's on that walk, the Mariner began to be composed initially with Wordsworth and then Coleridge taking over the whole story. Um, he wrote several things during this time about the nature of the imagination. One, just one I want to pick up for you um, at the same period, and it's relevant to us now. He said um, one of his uh, tasks as a poet was to look carefully and minutely at nature to understand it, both as a poet and as a scientist would. And he says, when we discover truths of nature, it's not enough that we have once swallowed a truth. The heart should have fed upon the truth as an insect upon a leaf till it be tinged with the green colour and show its food in every the minutest fibre. Wonderful image that we should absorb truth as an insect absorbs the green, the chlorophyll, from a leaf, and it should fill us. And one more about on this question of attention as he was uh, composing the, the ballad. A great poet must have the ear of a wild Arab listening in the silent desert, the eye of a North American Indian tracing the footsteps of an enemy upon the leaves that strew the forest, or the touch of a blind man feeling the face of a darling child. It's not the most extraordinary image, and there's three images, all of the kinds of sensitivity, tact, he calls it, that a poet has to have for what Wordsworth would call other modes of being, that sensitivity. I think particularly the blind man feeling the face of a darling child. Um, so um, he also, as they talked, they felt that their unity with nature was really the driving force for them of that's where the imagination was directed. And he wrote this wonderful passage, uh, 1795, and then he adjusted it later um, from one of the conversation poems, which I just want to place here in our mix. Oh, the one life within us and abroad, which meets all motion and becomes its soul. A light in sound, a sound like power in light, rhythm in all thought, joyance everywhere. Methinks it should have been impossible not to have all things in a world so filled, where the breeze warbles and the mute still air is music slumbering on her instruments. Again, another of those extraordinary courage images, the one life and the idea that the spirit, and we're coming back to this, plays upon nature, and we need to pay attention to that. So that's just very quickly a little background there. Now, I want to go through um, three symbols which I think are very powerful at work uh, in the poem. And, of course, I'm now moving towards an, a kind of eco-fable reading of that because I think this is indeed central to the poem. The first I mentioned is the polar spirit. This is quite interesting. There's a, uh, this picture... Uh, by David Scott. This is the very first illustration, set of illustrations, 1832. It's the only one that Coleridge saw. Because at the end of his life, suddenly this poem had become very widely known, and illustrators began to draw images from it. And uh, Coleridge says he really admired this. And the extraordinary thing, it's slightly Blakean, isn't it, in its influence. And although it's the polar spirit, it's in the air as well as underneath 
the sea underneath the ship, under the keel, nine fathoms deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. Uh, now, polar spirits, that means something to us now, I think. The whole imagery of the ice, what is happening up and down at the poles, particularly at the North Pole, this idea that the spirits of the pole have something to tell us. It's not entirely fanciful, this. Uh, Coleridge's um, great contemporary, Sir Joseph Banks, I found letters in which Banks is already collecting information from the, the mariners uh, looking for the Northwest Passage about the state of the Arctic ice. Uh, they're aware that it's shifting already. This is in the 1800s, all right? So for us, the idea that there is a polar spirit out there that is warning us about something, is already in the poem. You can ask, how could this be so 200 years ago? The science was beginning to be there. But also there's something strange, and I want to come back to this about the poem, that it's prophetic in the most extraordinary way. It's not so much that Courage himself was prophetic, but the poem itself gathers kinds of prophecy to it. Um, and that's one element in it. The second I want to look at is the spectre ship. Now, here's, I wanted to look more carefully. This is the verses that describe the life in death figure. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. Various things there. Uh, the gold is suddenly immediately followed by the sickness, leprosy, together. This is what's left of the nightmare crew. And they're going to dice for the life of the mariner's own crew. And this introduces whole ideas of chance and destiny, which Courage was very interested in. But also, and let's have a look at this. The, there's the Gustav Dore version. But again and again, this is a Noel Patton, a mid-Victorian one, quite clear sort of sexual element there. There's some kind of rivalry between death and the woman. Remember, they're dicing for the life of the crew, and death wins everything except the mariner, and she, life and death, wins the mariner. And I've already suggested that there's some, that the opposed, the demonic version of the ship, the mariner's own ship, and it's what could happen to his ship, all right? Just a little uh, spread out there. When people are now describing the planets and their, the way they've developed, often you will hear people say, Venus is what could happen to the Earth because of the destruction of all atmospheres and so on and the burning heat and so on. And there's a sense in which this is like an alternative, this ship is like an alternative planet. It's the alternative version of the mariner's ship, and it's what may happen. Um, and the idea that death and, and sickness and illness are all involved, the whole idea of chance and chaos, it's all in this image. And again and again it appears, um, there's an Edwardian version, there's a David Jones version, and very, very strikingly, there's the Mervyn Peake version. Uh, Mervyn Peake, remember, who, of course, was in a Japanese war camp and so on and so forth. Um, so th that image, uh, again and again, is repeated by the illustrators. There's a sense in which they don't quite know what to make of it, I feel. But it's the second uh, part of uh, the eco symbol, I think, the ship that is, in fact, doomed. Is, it carries death and sickness. And that, it, in a sense, it's the mirror the mirror version of the mariner's ship. Go back to the albatross. This is the modern statue, which is there. 2003, it went up on Watch It on the quayside. It's very striking when you walk up to it. Um, it it's isolation, and there are all the modern fishing boats. And there's that figure. There's another Mervyn Peak version of it. Now, the albatross... Of course, it's, it's sort of proverbial in our language to have an albatross around your neck. But again, 
hasn't it come to mean something particularly modern to us? Um, the fate of the albatross in the uh, Antarctic is representative of what is happening to so much animal and bird life. That's an Antarctic albatross, and of course what's happening, and I believe this has been mentioned before, is because of all the pollution and the rubbish that's going into the sea, the albatross, which of course is one of the birds that travel further, millions and millions of them are dying because they ingest tiny bits of plastic. I think there's a lighter in one of those. Okay. Uh, and I wanted to uh, rather sort of fiercely pull that out, that idea of Coleridge's albatross, that gosh, that symbol really has resonance and power for us now. And, and I think there's no doubt in my mind from having looked at the letters that Coleridge was, had a very particular idea about uh, having respect for animals and birds and creatures. They, they appear, it's extraordinary the number of birds that appear in, in not just the albatross, throughout his poems. So in a way, again, prophecy that the albatross um, of the poem, now it's become true that it has been shot again and again and again. So that seems to me the third with very, very powerful eco symbols in this poem. Now, just drawing back, I said that the, um, the illustrations told us a great deal um, about the way people looked at this. This is a famous decorative colour by Willy Pagani, 1910, so it's just post Edwardian. Um, and there, in a way, it's seen, the poem is still seen as a, uh, as a, dec a piece of decorative work. It's not seen as we might see it now. And it's very interesting to watch how these image, cover images change. Now that's uh, Duncan Grant, you know, the Bloomsbury Group and so on. And there he's taken the, the image of the ship, the painted ship upon a painted show, ocean. And we know that is the moment that the crew uh, are dying of drought and the, the, the uh, ghost ship is about to appear and under that burning sun. So he's taken that very powerful image. That's an American one, Alexander Calder, you know, who made the, the wonderful mobiles. And that he's produced a sort of skeleton mariner with the albatross again and the sun. Is it the sun or the moon there? But gradually, these images are becoming fiercer. And what is very interesting in the last 20 or so years that um, the poem has taken on more and more foolish. It's a very interesting way to play it, but the text is there in the poem. So it has that kind of life has continued um, with it. What I wanted to say, finally, is that um, you can follow this up in many different ways. Um, the Chris Jordan um, Albatross film, you can find, you just Google Chris Jordan Midway Albatross, which actually uses parts of the poem as well. Uh, there are wonderful readings, uh, starting with Richard Burton in 1955, Orson Welles. Um, there's a wonderful Fiona Shaw performance of it with a reading. 
which she did in New York at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I was there, I did the presentation for that. And you can find that uh, on Google. John Stuart Mill wrote a wonderful essay about Coleridge. And he said, whereas the utilitarians asked, asked the question always, what is the truth of something? What is the truth of it? And remember Coleridge's image of the truth, like the green color that has come through. That was the kind of question we needed to ask. But Coleridge wanted us to ask a slightly different one. What was the meaning of it? Not just what was the truth, what was the meaning of it? And in this very brief time, I've just tried to overfly some of the possible meanings of what I think is a very, very powerful eco-fable. If I had to sum up the poem, I think it's a warning. It's a warning poem. It looks, it causes us to be more conscious, not to do things unaware, not to do evil or destructive acts unaware. That we have a duty, just like the mariner had a duty to uh, the things of the earth and the animals. And if we don't fulfill this duty, it's not merely physical disaster that the Nature will take its revenge on us, like the polar spirit, like the spectre ship. But um, we ourselves will fall into some kind of destructive spiritual state. I think that's very clear, that's what has happened to the mariner. So it's not merely physical damage, but it's psychological, spiritual damage. Which, and I think that warning is also contained in the poem. So there you are, Green Bristol. <laughs> Be warned. As a warning tale uh, against one course of action or towards another course of action, um, you would think that such a warning tale would explain why that action happened, why the, why the mariner shot the albatross. So I'm wondering why the mariner shot the albatross and whether you have any theories about that, mm. apart from it's an obvious, dr dramatically introduced quite suddenly and, and obviously propels the narrative, um, but what deeper reasons you might suppose. Yes. Right. Um, in the, the passage from Shelvock I read uh, about Hatley, the second mate, remember, and there, there is a description that he was melancholy, he was depressed, and he thought the albatross was a bird of ill omen, and by shooting it, he would in some way save the ship, all right? Now, that's exactly the motive that Coleridge does not give. And it's very, very stark in the poem. Um, I just, if I can just quickly find that verse for you. Because it seems to me the fact that he refuses to give a motive uh, is what gives the poem an extraordinary strength. Remember, he's talking to the ancient mariner, and I mentioned this at the very end of the part one. God save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plagued thee thus. Why lookst thou so? With my crossbow, I shot the albatross. And that's it. There's no further explanation, right? Now, so why does he do that? Because this is a poet writing. And I think that he wants to leave it ambiguous. He wants to question what is the nature of evil. It's too easy, in a sense, to give it a motive. It forces us to ask the question you've just asked and then ask it of ourselves. Why should we do cruel or foolish or evil acts? The poem is raising that question. And so the idea of unaware is very crucial. And it's also repeated in the blessing when he gets back on for a moment on terms with nature. The spring of love gushed from my heart and I bless them, unaware. And it's the same idea of unawareness, something instinctive. So an, an, inst uh, an evil that's happened without motive might be cured by something instinctively good. So those are the questions that I think he's raising, but he does not want to solve. I think it's deliberately left uh, ambiguous. And in fact, uh, Wordsworth criticised him later. Re Wordsworth is amazingly rude about this poem. <laughs> amazingly rude. And the second edition of Lyrical Ballads, he moves it to the back. <laughs> Extraordinary. Uh, and there's a whole series of, uh, in his letters where he says something very similar to this, that uh, Coleridge gives the mariner no character, makes him passive. 
Um, it doesn't give him the character of, of a mariner and so on, but which is precisely why Coleridge had done that, to leave these questions open, I think. So Wordsworth, it's a very interesting um, clash of temperaments. Wordsworth wants it clear, wants it clarified. Coleridge doesn't. He wants to leave it like a folk tale. And that's why, of course, it, it's resonant now. If it was all sorted out, that bit would finish. There are many sources, and it's perhaps a silly game to try and uh, pin yeah. them down. Mm. But I would just like to raise the uh, example of the second voyage of Captain Cook. Yes. And although the ancient mariner didn't go and map the coast of Australia, the <laughs> voyage that she followed to the South Seas was very much that of Captain Cook's second yeah. voyage. Yeah. And Cook in his journal actually says, no vessel has ever gone so far south. Yes, yes. And one of the naturalists on board in his journal says that the sea putrefies. The and rotting ocean. Yeah. Yes. And the astronomer on the voyage ends up teaching mathematics at Christ's Hospital when Coleridge is a boy there. And he not only mentions the water snakes, but the gunshot sounds of cracking ice. Yes. Um, I don't know if you think there's any... Yes. That. Yes, no, I think that, that's absolutely right. And that it, certainly they were, Southey and Wordsworth are all collecting uh, particular voyages, Hakluyt as well, Captain Cook, first and second voyage. Of course, the first scientist on the first voyage was Joseph Banks, who Courage got to know and so on. I, I think that's absolutely right. And so we spread this a bit wider because um, why was there such an interest in these sea voyages at this time? There's no doubt about it. Um, and even people like... Uh, Courage's great friend Davy were fascinated by this and the idea that you could go aboard a ship uh, in some role as a scientist to view this. Uh, it's very interesting. It's part of the romantic uh, tradition at, by this point. Do you remember um, uh, at Keats's uh, the, great, the Great Party, the great famous dinner, the immortal dinner with Wordsworth and Keats and Benjamin Robert Hayden and so on. And they discussed various things. And one, one of the um, discussions was about voyages. And the young man, Richard, Ri Joseph Ritchie, who was Keats's great friend there, uh, was about to embark on just such a voyage, which would take him down through Africa. They were delighted with this. And Keats was particularly pleased because Joseph Ritchie said, I will take a copy of your new poem, Endymion, and throw it in the middle of the Sahara. Is that a wonderful idea? So I think that what I'm saying is you're right, uh, but it's very interesting that there was a general cultural interest in voyages. And, of course, that brings us back here to Bristol uh, because the tradition of the sea voyage is very much here. Here it's right on your doorstep all the time, I think. I also have to say that um, Coleridge had never made a sea voyage at the time he wrote this. All he'd done was cross on the Chepstow Ferry. All right? <laughs> uh, but later on, I don't know if I've got the little passage here, he, um, when he goes to Malta, he, he makes a series of sea voyages, and they're, they're rather desperate, a lot of them. Um, and he, he begins to rewrite passages as the Mariner. Um, I didn't have time to talk about this, but um, there's a, a further edition of the Mariner, Mariner that comes out in 1817 in Sibylline Leaves, uh, and he uses stanzas that he'd rewritten there. Uh, here we are, from the Malta Journal, all right? Um, so this is finally Courage doing his own bit of exploring. Uh, and as you say, the, um, the particular sounds uh, of the ice and so on, he got from reading. But now he was getting the wonderful descriptions of what the wake looks like. And how about this from his journal? Uh, this is just off Malta, 1804. A hawk with battered plumage, flew overhead and settled on the bowsprit until the sailors shot at it. It flew off heavily among the other ships there in convoy, about 25 ships. And the firing was heard from further and further away as each crew refused it hospitality in turn. Poor hawk, this is Corrie, poor hawk. Oh, strange lust of murder in man. It is not cruelty. It is mere non-feeling from non-thinking. Non-feeling from non-thinking. Coleridge Journal, 1804. Right? So thank you very much for that question. It's allow me to, to bring that back and to answer to some extent the question of the motive that you asked. Um, 
I think it was um, Wordsworth, actually, himself, that um, gave a couple of ideas for the mariner, one of which was actually that the mariner should kill the tutelary spirit of the, of the Antarctic. And going back to the first question, um, yeah. in balladry, in traditional balladry, Edward, Edward, for example, which is in um, Percy. Percy's Relics, yeah. yes. Uh, there's a lot of examples of um, violent actions with no explanation at all. Yes. And um, it seems to me that um, having studied uh, Coleridge's revisions of the ancient mariner, that he revised it in m much more in accordance with traditional balladry that he knew of. Mm. And that the um, act being inexplicable... Was was part actually of part of yes. that tradition. I think that's a very good point, and I, I didn't really have the time to explain that. Of course, he revised it. People think he wrote this in that, uh, simply on that walk. He wrote the first half of the poem on that walk, and then that, which was in November, it's about 300 lines, and the remaining, over 300 lines, it took him another three or four months to write. He brought it up to Dorothy in March 1798. And of course, then there was a first revision of 1800, and then, as you say, even further revisions for the 1817 edition. And then he adds the famous glosses, which are little marginal glosses, which, again, uh, emphasize uh, parts of the symbolism. The polar spirit, which I've mentioned, is very much mentioned in that. And again, it, it, it moves towards that tradition of balladry. It's like the scholar's version. It might be worth just mentioning, you mentioned Wordsworth um, claiming Wow, Wordsworth claims a great deal. <laughs> Let me just read you. This is what Rhodes is about. Much the greatest part of the story was Mr. Coleridge's invention. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but certain parts I myself suggested, for example, some crime was to be committed which should bring upon the old navigator, as Coleridge afterwards delighted in calling him, the spectral persecution as in consequence of that crime. And his own wanderings, and his own wanderings, I had been reading in Shelvock's Voyage, Sir Ed Coleridge, um, a day or two before, that while doubling Cape Horn, they frequently saw albatrosses in that latitude. Suppose, I said, you represent him as having killed one of these birds on entering the South Sea, and that the tutelary spirit of these regions takes upon them to avenge the crime. This incident was thought fit for the purpose and adapted accordingly. I also suggested <laughs> the navigation of the ship by the dead men, but do not recall that I had anything more to do with the scheme of the poem. <laughs> okay. Well, this uh, from uh, Elizabeth Fenwick's notes. They're long after Coach has died. Um, and I tried to introduce, and of course in my biography I'm able to do this much more, to show how each of those images come from very deep in Coleridge's own childhood. That I'll give you one example that the, he recollects in his um, letters written before the Mariner to Tom Poole about his beloved sister Nancy who died and how she would sing him ballads um, when she was holding him, the baby Coleridge, still loving to be a baby at four or five. Uh, being rocked by Nancy. And he remembered one of the ballads was a, sea, a shipwrecked sailor floating dead. That's the, the phrase that he remembers it. Now, that's probably from being six, all right? So the, those ideas uh, of the mariner out there on the sea were in his reading, in his childhood. I gave the example of the way the sun and the moon comes out of the clocks. Uh, he uh, had read Shelvock quite clearly. Uh, he also said um, John Cruikshank, a local farmer, had come up with the idea of the, uh, the crew, the dead crew, navigating a ship. So there are a whole series of sources. It's, it's, from a literary point of view, it's quite interesting that Wordsworth, who criticised the poem throughout Coleridge's life, once Coleridge was dead, was claiming to have written <laughs> a great deal of it. Um, now, that's... That's my, that's the biographer's point of view, all right. But it's very interesting how when a, a poem gathers weight like that, suddenly everybody 
wants to be part of it, all right. But it's a guarantee of how powerful the poem is, it, it brings in, all right. And again, it's, I've mentioned, and I've mentioned again, this very strange thing, what I call the prophetic quality of the poem. It's not that Coleridge knew that albatrosses would suffer in the 21st century, but it's that the poem itself kind of draws this image out of nature, and it's there waiting. It's latent, and then it bursts forth upon us. I can't quite explain this, but I, there is something here, something in the prophetic quality of a really great poem like that. And that's why it speaks to us now. Anyway, a lot more to say than that, but blessings upon Wordsworth, no doubt he wanted to. So that's what I feel. Uh, you talked about the ambiguity and the mysticism of the poem, but by the time it gets to the moral at the end, yes. it feels quite almost simplistic that if, if we all go to church and pray yeah. that everything is going to be okay. Yes. Um, so I just wondered what you felt about that. Yes, you're quite right. It, it comes out of the bird and, and beast that we bless them and so on. Um, and it, it's perfectly obvious that that moral, which is like a child, the end of a children's story, isn't it, is not adequate. It's inadequacy to what's happened is, I think, the whole poetic point. That's what the mariner, the survivor, who's been through all this trauma, that's all he can express in s literal terms. But, of course, he's expressed it all through the poem. And I think it's a deliberate device of Coleridge's. It's like using certain kinds of imagery to use simplicity almost as a, a kind of trap to trap you, to make you think, how, how can that explain what happened? And that's exactly the reaction he wants. So um, it's the moral of the story. He said, um, when questioned about it, um, did it about this end, uh, he said, uh, my only personal criticism, he said, it's got too much moral. I designed it to have no morality at all. And of course, again, that, that's a very provoking statement to make. So uh, I don't think uh, that little rhyming, neat rhyming cup, it's like the end of a Shakespeare comedy, isn't it, when everything rhymes and fits in. Um, that's, not, that's not meant to be the message we take away. It tells us something about what the mariner has been through, I think, that he comes back to this very, hanging on to this very simple idea. Uh, just repeat again that C Coleridge said the mariner, when all this happened to him, was a very young man, okay? And now he's the ancient mariner because he's been wandering around repeating the story again and again and again, and it's simplified into these bare bones like that. Um, a very brief aside before my question. I was privileged to be in the company of 23 poets, each writing their own lyrical, lyrical ballad. Nearly all of them made the point that they got on very well with Coleridge, but they couldn't get on with Wordsworth at all. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to reduce this from symbolism and metaphor, and, but to what extent do you think Coleridge could have had any idea that there he was standing at the threshold of modernity, industrialization, globalism via empire in its various stages, this whole mess that we got ourselves into. Did he have any idea of the, the magnitude of the mess that was being created in, mm. in, in his time? Uh, first of all, about Wordsworth, I don't want to lead an anti-Wordsworth campaign at all. <laughs> um, I'll just tell you one thing. They were, it was, it's one of the great friendships in literature. The fact that at the end, when they grew older, it was a bit more difficult, but they remained friends. They went together in the, 1820s to Germany and so on. They were very funny about each other, actually. Very funny, two old guys together. Um, and I would just quote you, when they, the first time they went in Germany, um, they split up. Uh, Courage was um, at Hamburg and Ratzeburg, and um, Wordsworth went down to the little villages in the Hartz Mountains. And they corresponded <laughs> by letter. And the correspondence was very slow, because it was one of the coldest winters, and all the lakes and the roads were frozen. So letters would arrive very slowly. And bits of the prelude started being sent back to Courage by then in Göttingen. Um, and the wonderful skating passage was sent. And Courage read this, and I think the letter in some way was damaged, but this line, these lines were there. And he wrote back to Wordsworth, he said, if I had found these lines 
running wild in the deserts of Arabia, I would have shouted out, Wordsworth! <laughs> okay, and it, it's just something. Um, and you can look up also the exchange about um, the nightingale, tell me Wordsworth, what you think my bird's worth, and so on. So uh, we, you know, it was a great creative friendship. And in fact, the, the, the fact that there were difficulties in them, and, and there's something uh, really touching about Wordsworth actually claiming, trying to claim his way back into the ancient mariner. I, I don't think it should be held against him. Now, the, that was, I've been so passionate about that. What was the punch of your second part of your question? <laughs> Oh, yes, okay, yes, no, very well put. Yes, how much, this goes back to my idea of the prophetic thing. I think what you see, remember uh, Coleridge, in the, as it were, the second act of his career, goes out during the uh, Napoleonic Wars, he goes out to Malta and Gibraltar and so on, and he serves quite amazingly in Malta for 18 months. He's the, uh, the, the second most important person in the government of Malta in wartime. Uh, serving under Sir Alexander Ball, who was one of Nelson's admirals. Very tough guy, and they got on amazingly well. But one, why I introduce this is because uh, Courage was suddenly plunged into the idea of international affairs warfare. And I think he saw, he writes about the English impact in the Mediterranean, the role of Napoleon, uh, and the whole idea of imperial conquest, the beginning to move. So I think he was aware of that because... He, unlike Wordsworth, he did, he did move within uh, uh, it, what were pre-imperial uh, circles there. And it, it's quite dramatic what he writes about. I mean, some of the last letters uh, which um, Alexander Bowl sent to Nelson before the Battle of Trafalgar, I've seen them, they're in Courage's hand. He copied them. He copied them as first secretary. Um, so that Courage is part of the, um, international affairs in a way. Whether the whole question of um, what we now think of industrialization and so on, um, that's harder to see. But um, they, I think they were very well aware that, the way that nature was under siege already. And I think that is a powerful theme of the poem. And of course, in, in, in much of the prelude and so on, that how nature is this amazing resource for us and mustn't be damaged. But I think one can read too far ahead. I think it's the, almost the next generation, the early Victorian writers, uh, Tennyson in memoriam, amazing passages about what modern geology is doing and how it's changing our view of the world and so on. But this is it's not that much later. It's written in the 1832. Courage dies 1834. There's an amazing overlap there. And of course, the younger poets like Tennyson are reading Wordsworth and Coleridge and Keats all the time. So there's a passing on of that tradition and that critique. But probably we have to wait for that generation of Carlyle, Ruskin, and so on before that real understanding. But then they draw upon the Romantic poets for the imagery about this and so on. So it is a great tradition. And again, I repeat this word, a prophetic tradition in some way. And that's why it's still there for us now. We are going to have to draw it to a close there. If you've got any more questions or would like to get a copy of any of Richard's magnificent books, they're available at the front, as he will be. I should say that to Richard that it was reading your biography of Coleridge that set us off on this journey of launching this new series of Good. Coleridge lectures, and we're delighted to have had you here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Thank you most of all to Richard Holmes. Thank you. Thank you.